Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone, wherever you are on the globe. I would like to welcome you all to the uh, joint WIMRISE event for uh, today. So let me just one second. I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. And here we go. So uh, today I am very excited to have uh, Dr. Shadi uh, Barconi from the Technical University of Munchen as a co-chair. And we are very delighted to have Dr. Amy Diel as our keynote, who's gonna take us on uh, a long journey with regard to the pandemic, talking about the challenges that we might have faced as researchers, particularly female scientists. So just, I would like to first give you a brief overview about the WIM and the RISE history. How did they both come about? So the WIM was uh, officially approved by the Mikai board in 2016. And the four founding members, uh, I think they saw a dire need for building a community that supports female scientists and uh, overcome gender bias uh, within Mikai. So, Together, they put the WIM mission, which aims to promote a gender balanced Mikai research community and overcome gender bias. The WIM aims also to support female minorities within Mikai, foster an inclusive and diverse Mikai community, and promote the code of conduct, uh, conduct at Mikai meetings. So we welcome everyone to join the WIM today. So if you are interested, there is a QR code on top above. Feel free to scan it, take a screenshot and like fill out the form. So I would like to uh, give special thanks to the wonderful Mikai board members who have served our community for the last three years and to give a warm welcome to the new WIM board members who would take the WIM further towards hopefully a bigger outreach and a deeper, uh, stronger impact. So while the WIM focuses on supporting female scientists and uh, promoting gender balance, we notice that uh, when it comes to geographic diversity, the geographic diversity of Mikai researchers, there it's, it's pretty limited. So for example, here, we can see that for Mikai 2020, only 4% of the submissions came from low middle income countries. And there's a big part of the world that remains out of, of our reach, including Africa, South America, and Southeastern Asia. So out of 103 low middle income countries, only four countries had papers accepted at Mikai 2019 and six last year. So this uh, shows us that there is a negligible contribution from LMIC to healthcare and imaging. This is not out of negligence, but I believe it's because of the limited outreach that you know, we need to build towards those countries. A limited contribution in handling global health crisis such as pandemics. This also shows us the absence of a global health network to collaborate and find solutions to urgent global health problems and crisis. And, here, we can contribute as a, as a community to building such a network within Mikai. So also in those countries, there is a lot of untapped potential and untapped potential is definitely a wasted talent and we don't wanna waste talent. So this is how we got motivated and inspired to build the RISE Mikai network, which got approved uh, a few months ago from the Mikai board. So what is the RISE mission? The RISE aims to propel inclusiveness and geographic diversity within Mikai. We particularly focus on strengthening the presence of minority researchers in low middle income countries uh, at Mikai. We empower Mikai researchers in those countries. And we aim to pave the way for future stars to rise there. So we're gonna empower them with our future RISE activities. And definitely, this is a win-win situation for everybody as we aim to build a strong international network that bridges the gap between high income and low middle income countries. And, by, and this definitely will help reduce global disparities in health and imaging in general. So, so far we have 88 RISE members. We're so excited to have people uh, joining us uh, on board. And if you want to become an ambassador of your own country, 
uh, whether it is high income, low income, doesn't matter. You guys have a form to fill out. Please go ahead and fill it out. There is also the QBAR uh, code on top there. And uh, I would like all to you know, remind everyone here, including myself, that we never rise alone. We always rise together. So we also welcome everyone on board. We are organizing later in the day two networking events. So I'm gonna we're we're gonna give you more details, data based, you know, uh, you know, presentation about the women the rice, and we will also have the opportunity to connect with each other and to network via the spatial chats. So make sure that you uh, guys mark those on your calendar. Now this year, uh, we with this amazing organizing committee, Sofia, Marwa, Andrea, we have organized the first will competition where participants get to interview inspirational Mikai members. So so far we got eight submissions and we have uploaded them to the Wim Will YouTube channel. I would like to thank every uh, all the participants, including the interviewers and the interviewee. And uh, if you guys would like to uh, learn more, have a look at our YouTube channel. And the top three winners will be announced during the Mikai closing and awards ceremony. So do not miss that. Now, coming to the most important part of our, uh, of our event today. So I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Amy Diel, who is joining us today as a keynote. She will give a talk on female scientists and the pandemic surviving or thriving. Dr. Diel serves as Chief Information Officer at Wilson College and is a workplace gender bias expert and consultant. She has a PhD in Administration and Leadership from Indiana University of Pennsylvania. She was named to the 2020 Ed Tech Dean's List of Higher Education IT Influencers Worth a Follow and a 2019 Central Penn Business Journal Woman of Influence. Her research has published in a, uh, was published in academic journals, book chapters, and magazines such as Fast Company, Miss Magazine, and University Business Magazine. She is a frequent conference speaker, workshop facilitator, and has served as a gender discrimination lawsuit expert witness. For more about her, you can visit her website. And I would like to welcome her now. Amy, thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this talk for a while now. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are located in the globe. I'm su super glad to be here. I'm going to share my, share my screen and share some slides with you. Okay, you should see my first, uh, my first slide. Okay, so I wanna to start today's talk with a little bit of background about myself. Um, I studied computer science when I was an undergraduate uh, in college, and I have worked in the information technology field in both for-profit business and higher education. So you may be aware that like some other fields, information technology is male dominated. And although I did well in my roles, I also experienced some unexplainable problems. To learn how to be a leader, what I did was I watched the men around me um, but I found that my leadership wasn't always accepted like that of the men's. Um, for example, I would watch the men be authoritative when decisions, decisions needed to be made uh, and there wasn't consensus. So when that happened, what I found was their decisiveness maintained or increased the level of respect that others had for them. So early on, when I tried the same approach, I remember one meeting in particular where I announced the decision at the end of the meeting that I was leading it was a meeting in which we had failed to come to consensus. Uh, but I found that my, I had lost points. I actually lost points with my, uh, lost respect with my, with my own staff by exerting my authority. And at the same time, I knew that I couldn't be tentative and I couldn't be indecisive or else I would be seen as not competent. So I had spent years watching the male leaders around me and I started to question, why was I getting negative results from leading exactly the same way as the men were? <laughs> And at first, you know, for, for actually for a long time, I thought I was at fault. Uh, when I started working, nobody told me that I would be perceived differently because I was a woman. I was running into barriers that were invisible. I couldn't see them and others couldn't see them. And so this has brought me on this, on this journey. I've been researching bias towards women and the bias, bias against women in the workplace for the past 
of 12 years. And right away, I learned that I wasn't unique or alone in my experiences. So for today's talk, I'm going to talk about female scientists and the pandemic. Are we surviving or, or are we thriving? And truth be told, it's some of both. Pandemic or not, gender bias constrains women in the workplace. And so I'm going to share today some common barriers that women face, as well as organizational and some personal strategies for overcoming them. So this pandemic has forced enormous changes on how we on how and where we work. And, and like Islam stated, it really has been a journey. Um, for many years, um, and for many years prior to the pandemic, women have been clamoring for more flexible work and work from home. Often that, and often those requests were to, to deaf organizational ears. So about 18 months ago or so, this change was suddenly forced upon all of us. Um, and the primary positive outcomes of, of the change in our work, our work environment, the primary positive outcomes for women have been for women whose roles could be done remotely. And we know that that's not all, and it's not, perhaps not even a majority of women. Um, but if we think about our role as scientists, it's probably more of a mix of work that can be done remotely and work that has a, a hands-on or lab-based component. But nonetheless, I want to present some upsides of the pandemic. So one of the upsides is that first upside is that it has increased flexibility on our working hours. Uh, it has increased work from home opportunities for many women in white collar roles, um, which eliminates time, money, uh, and stress spent commuting, and also allows more time for family, exercise, and personal pursuits. And then lastly, just like today and like this Mackay conference, uh, virtual conferences mean more of us can attend and we don't have the overhead or expense involved in traveling, nor do we have to worry about childcare for those days and nights that we might be away from home. But when we look at data for female scientists, we're also finding the pandemic downsides. So a recent report from the United States-based National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine found that pan the pandemic had negatively affected female scientists' work-life balance, productivity, and mental health. So during the lockdowns, in particular last year, women bore the brunt of family responsibilities, such as caring for both children whose schools had closed and older relatives. And so while virtual conferences have increased opportunities for female scientists to attend, this National Academy study found that women reported difficulty contributing to, that, to them because of distractions in the home, or because of poor behavior from male attendees, such as interrupting female speakers. There have also been several studies that have noted a decline in the number of journal authors authored, I'm sorry, journal articles authored by women. And then furthermore, over the past year, institutions have eliminated a number of non-tenured faculty and staff member positions. Uh, an Australian study found that female scientists are 1.5 times more likely to be in short-term contract jobs and we're more likely to lose jobs, paid hours, and career opportunities than their male uh, counterparts. Uh, so female researchers have also found it challenging to care for children and oversee, to care for and oversee children uh, at home and deal with uh, family responsibilities while working. Uh, nearly three quarters of the respondents in the National Academy study had increased childcare demands and nearly half felt challenged by the accessibility and, afford and affordability of childcare. And then another final way in which female researchers have been impacted is in the media. Uh, male voices have dominated the scientific community on the pandemic in many countries. In the UK, for example, there was an imbalance of 2.7 men for every female expert featured on television, radio, news programs on the political hand handling of the uh, uh, coronavirus outbreak. And then if we look at the low middle income countries, the disparities for women scientists caused by the pandemic have been even worse. So the closure of universities and other institutions, along with the redirecting of funding in those that remain open, has brought ongoing research projects to a halt. Uh, one survey conducted by the Organization for Women in Science uh, for the Developing World uh, of its more than 5,000 members, uh, the survey was conducted between March and June of 2020, it showed the impact which you can see on the screen, it showed the impact of travel, uh, experiments and field work, teaching, publishing, and then note the employment loss. 
So really what the pandemic has done is to exacerbate the bias that women have already and for a long time, forever experienced in the workplace. Um, I want to give you a definition for gender bias. Um, gender bias consists of barriers which arise from cultural beliefs about gender, as well as workplace structures, uh, practices, and patterns of interaction that, that inadvertently favor men. These cultural beliefs and structures which already favored men in scientific settings prior to the pandemic continued to favor men during the pandemic when, for example, women's productivity lagged due to their disproportionate care responsibilities. So although productivity decreases may be temporary, and we hope that they are, <laughs> the disproportionate hits to women's reputations and their scientific impact may compound over time, potentially setting female scientists back by years, if not decades, compared to their male colleagues. So my co-researchers and I uh, recently developed a scale to measure gender bias. Uh, it's called the Gender Bias Scale for Women Leaders. And the scale was published in uh, Human uh, Resource Development Quarterly. As a part of the scale development, we identified the six primary factors or barriers that make up this concept of gender bias. The six barriers are, uh, first, male privilege, which dominates the workplace environment. Women may gain entry into this environment, but there are disproportionate constraints on their choices and behavior. There may be insufficient support provided to the women, as well as devaluation of, their, of the women's contributions. And hostility towards women may be used to keep them in line. And then finally, women may acquiesce to their supposed place in the male-dominated culture. So we'll spend a little bit of time here, but I wanna give you some examples of each. First is male privilege. A male privileged workplace culture assumes that men are the leaders and that men control resources and set standards for the culture. Women may gain entry into this environment, but only in ways that are not threatening to the men's privilege. In this male privileged environment, there's a male culture, which includes the assumption that men are in charge. Informal conversations and social activities may reflect a boys club and revolve around typical male interests, such as sports, cars, drinking, outdoor activities. And sometimes they may, it may even include lewd and sexist jokes. Uh, in a male culture, men may act as gatekeepers, controlling which women have access to leadership and the bounds of the women's leadership and their opportunities. Another aspect of male privileged environment is is role incredulity, which I'll explain with the story of the woman in this photo. This woman is Dr. Tamika Cross. Dr. Cross was on a Delta Airlines flight in 2016. Uh, sometime after takeoff, a man two rows in front of her suddenly became unresponsive and a flight attendant called for help. Cross, Dr. Cross, who is an obstetrician and gynecologist, immediately flagged down one of the crew members offering to treat the man. But she got a response she wasn't prepared for. Oh no, sweetie, put your hand down. We're looking for actual physicians or nurses or some type of medical personnel. We don't have time to talk to you. She then had to go through further questions to prove that she was a real medical doctor. Meanwhile, the gentleman was suffering a serious in medical incident. And in the meantime, an older white man showed up and said he was a doctor and he was allowed to treat the patient. So what Dr. Cross experienced was this concept of role incredulity, which occurs when outsiders mistake women who are serving as leaders or who are serving in other traditional male roles, like they're scientists, they're engineers, they're tech support, lawyers, physicians. They're mistaken though for a tradition, being in a traditional female role. So like administrative support or court reporters or nurses. A key problem with assuming that women are in support roles is that their words and actions do not carry as much weight the authority of their actual position is diminished. In a, in a recent survey of women scientists, nearly half of the black women, 48%, and Latina women, 47%, are, this is a survey in the United States, by the way, uh, reported experiencing role incredulity, having been mistaken for administrative or custodial staff. It was an experience that was somewhat less common for the white and Asian American women uh, scientists. So it was about 32% of the, the white women and uh, 23% of the uh, Asian American women. A further aspect of, a male, of male privilege is this concept of a class cliff. 
Uh, a glass cliff occurs when a woman is placed into a top leadership position when the organization is in a state of crisis or in a state of decline. So the woman is put on a glass cliff, a risky or perilous situation in which she will be blamed or let go and or let go if she doesn't perform the miraculous. And this picture, by the way, was a picture that was taken uh, in the Willis Tower um, in Chicago uh, in the United States. This is a, a tower formerly known as the Sears Tower. Uh, on the top floor, there's an observation deck about 100, well, top floor is about 103, 103 floors up. Um, there's this glass ledge which visitors can walk out and sit down and look on the, on the city below. So I got to do this a, a couple years ago and it was pretty freaky. <laughs> So the next barrier, the next factor is disproportionate constraints. Women may be constrained to act in certain ways, subordinate to men, and they may be expected to play supportive roles to male power. Their communication may be constrained. So constrained communication consists of restrictions on when women may contribute to the conversation. This can include consistent criticism when expressing disagreement, being interrupted by men in conversation, and having ideas supported or acknowledged in meetings only after they're restated by men. Women's communication style is also often constrained. Women may find that being too directive breaks female norms while being too tentative breaks leader norms. So this was the exact problem I was running into when I was a young uh, IT leader. And then there's a few terms, there's a few other terms I wanna give you that relate to this uh, this phenomenon. Uh, the first one is heap heat. So heap heat is when a woman suggests an idea and it's ignored, but then a man says the same thing and everyone loves it. <laughs> the next one is uh, bro appropriate. Uh, this is more intentional. It occurs when a man repeats a woman's idea and takes active credit for it. Manterrupt is when a man unnecessarily interrupts a woman. And then finally, I think you've probably all heard, a lot of you have probably heard the term mansplain. This one's a little bit more common as uh, out there as a term. Um, mansplain is when a woman, uh, excuse me, when a man interrupts a woman to explain to her something that she actually knows more about than he does. And as we know, these behaviors can occur in both face-to-face -face interactions as well as virtual ones. So emotional labor is another type of disproportionate constraint on women. Emotional labor involves bandaging and producing feelings. One example is a flight attendant whose job it is to be excessively nice to passengers. Uh, teaching and childcare are other professions in which emotional labor is an expectation of the job. So while it could be argued that the flight attendant, the teacher, the childcare worker are paid for their emotional labor, women are disproportionately expected to perform emotional labor even when it's not a formal part of their job duties. For example, they may be expected to act as cheerleaders towards men in the workplace, have a constant smile, be caring and nurturing, and buffer men's emotions. And next, to ensure that women don't deviate from behavior and performance expectations, they may be subject to scrutiny. And in fact, their dress and their appearance may be the focus and their job performance may be scrutinized in ways above and beyond that of men. So this now ubiquitous virtual format is very interesting in that the focus is always, is typically on our faces, okay? In, per, in in person settings, we don't spend all day looking directly at each other in this way. Um, so since the pandemic, many women have been spending extra time on hair and makeup um, and logging in early uh, for virtual meetings in order to check their appearance and background. Women know that they're being scrutinized and they may expend extra energy in preparing their appearance in the hopes of gaining a hearing for their ideas. So the next one, the next factor is insufficient support. Women may, may lack access to social structures and networks that would support their advancement. They may lack mentoring relationships and they may, may lack sponsors who could recommend them uh, for advancement. In addition, they also may face exclusion from informal networks, unofficial social events, and sometimes even formal professional events. 
These are all, all places where work relationships are built and decisions are made. And this has only been exacerbated by the pandemic. So as events have moved to virtual platforms, it has been even harder for women, women to make these connections. Next factor is devaluation. Devaluation consists of attempts to make women seem less important and detract from their authority. Women's contributions may be devalued if they are acknowledged at all. It may be assumed that they will handle administrative work, including office housework. And they may experience backlash if they refuse. So office housework are activities that are very helpful in keeping the organization uh, running smoothly. They're just not often officially recognized or rewarded. So examples are things like taking notes in a meeting, serving on committees, organizing the office party, cleaning out the office refrigerator or microwave, uh, helping a, even helping a colleague to improve a presentation or a project. And another new source of pandemic office housework is, has been making phone calls to colleagues to check up on them, check on their, let's see how they're doing. Uh, women are under social pressure to volunteer for office housework, and they're more likely to experience backlash if they refuse. Uh, Dr. Adam Grant uh, from the University of Pennsylvania has written, when a woman declines to help a colleague, people like her less and her career suffers. But when a man says no, he faces no backlash. A, a man who doesn't help is busy. A woman is selfish. So diminishment is another way that uh, women are devalued. It includes behaviors which attempt to make the woman seem less important or detract from her authority. Examples here are put downs, disparagement, belittling, assuming or even assuming a woman's opportunities are the result of her gender only. One way that diminishment occurs is when titles and credentials are used for men but omitted for women. This type of thing happens often to female professors, scientists, researchers, physicians, coaches, pastors, and even military personnel. Previously, there had been no, like there were no terms to describe this phenomenon uh, other than omitting titles or omitting credentials. And so when there's no word for something, it's almost as if it doesn't exist. So my co-author, Dr. Leanne Dubinsky and I coined some words, uh, untitling and uncredentialing. Untitling occurs when, um, when first names are used instead of a title uh, and title and last names in professional situations. Uncredentialing typically occurs in writing. It's when a man's credentials like MD, PhD are used, but the woman's credentials are omitted. So if you're in a situation, a tip here is you're in, if you're in a situation and you're not sure what to call a professional woman, default to using her title. She'll likely tell you if she wants to be addressed by her first name. And this has actually been an article that Dr. Lemitsky and I co-authored for, uh, for Fast Company. And the link there is in the slide, which I'll be sharing the slides with your group after the session. Devaluation is also often reflected in women's pay in which they earn less than men for similar work. Salaries are unequal even when compared by position. So these are exa some examples from the United States. And what you can see is that the gap is not as wide in fields that are female dominated like nursing and teaching, but the men are still earning more. Um, what we, found, what, what we found in our research is that sometimes women are given excuses for a lower salary, that the reason that they're getting a lower salary is, is because of family situation, where the women's incomes are, being, are seen as supplemental or secondary. And as you can see on the chart, the pay ratio for medical scientists in the United States is 85%. But in fact, a study of 55,000 new PhDs in the US found that the pay ratio for their first jobs in 2018-19 was even lower than that. It was 76%. The women were earning 76% of what the men were earning. And then when you look at sal salary inequality globally, what you see is it varies by region. The pay ratios are higher in Western Europe and North America. They're, uh, they're above 75%. And they're lowest in South Asia at 62% and the Middle East and North Africa, they're about 
Um, and as you can see, the pay ratio has some relationship to the economic participation and opportunity rates. Um, and the other thing I'll note about this particular report is that it was, it's from the World Economic Forum. Um, and it was from this, this year, but it does not fully reflect the, the, it does not reflect the full impact of the pandemic. So the next barrier uh, or factor is a hostility, which is an act of resistance to women's presence and in its attempt to keep them in their place. They may face discrimination, such as being denied opportunities for challenging assignments, job-related travel, and promotions. Um, they may also face workplace harassment, which includes verbal abuse, bullying, sabotage, and of course, sexual harassment. Not all harassment comes from men. In order to protect themselves, some women may reinforce sexist norms against other women. This is known as queen bee syndrome. This occurs when women at the top fail to help other women or actively prevent their promotion. This is usually driven by insecurity. When women are worried that their, that their perches may be pulled from beneath them at any given moment, at any given moment they may uh, react by, put, by putting other women down. Uh, so when they're made to second guess themselves, they may, may try to maintain their dominance and, and as I mentioned, by keeping other women uh, below them down. So the transition to remote work uh, last year has actually led to some different opportunities for harassment. Um, so while it may have lessened harassment that involves physical contact, remote work has actually made it easier for some employees to exert power over others. And this, this is because the channels through which remote work occurs, such as texting, phone, video, web conferencing, they're often unmonitored, unrecorded, or they occur outside of employer-sponsored platforms. So it can be actually easier to harass because there's so much privacy in these interactions. There are no colleagues nearby while a harasser is yelling at somebody, nobody to oversee or overhear uh, the harassment or help stop it. Uh, according to a Deloitte survey in the United States, 52% of women have experienced some form of harassment in the past year. Uh, women of color and LGBTQ women were significantly more likely to experience these non-inclusive behaviors. And then finally, the last barrier is acquiescence. When the barriers are so prevalent, women may internalize them and adapt to, limit to the limitations. Uh, first, women may choose to not speak up about workplace sexism in order to maintain loyalty to the male leaders. This is a self-protection mechanism. Self-silencing usually occurs when women are made to feel insecure in their positions, and it's a way to maintain a, a position of favor uh, with male colleagues and superiors. And then last, women may limit their aspirations, deciding either that they're not capable of advancement or that they're just unwilling to deal with the pressures of professional advancement that the men just don't face. This one may likely be an outcome of women having to deal with all the other barriers. So before we move on to solutions, I want to talk about why this matters. You know, why, why is supporting women is so critical in your field? And here's just one example. Um, you know, women are half of our society but often their healthcare needs haven't been considered. And I'm gonna give you one example and that's mammography. Uh, mammography was first developed in the 1960s by two French male engineers, uh, Jean Benz and Emile Gabet. On the left, you see what was essentially the mammography machine design that has been used for the past 50 years. It's a machine with angular metallic buckies or platforms that can feel very cold and painful. So for more than half a century, women have had to endure a mammogram machine that really wasn't designed with their needs in mind. And hence, lots of women are fearful and they skip their mammogram. So recently, a team of female engineers at General Electric set out to develop a machine that wouldn't scare women. The final design, which is shown on the right, has a thin black bucky with smooth round edges and a warm carbon fiber surface. It has a remote control so that women can compress their own breasts and it has armrests and LED lights that encourage women to relax. And it's actually been said that it's almost spa-like. 
This new design came about thanks to a development team of women. These are the women who spearheaded it. If women, if the women didn't advocate for and lead the design efforts, would GE have considered and developed the develop, would have they invested in developing a machine uh, that would lessen women's fear? It's just something to consider. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on the last, the last minutes of my talk here. I'm gonna move on to solutions. What can we done? How can we eliminate bias so that women can contribute fully in our workplaces? And so the short answer is that the work culture must change. But let me tell you that revising work culture is a long, hard, iterative process. But the good news is we can all be part of that change. So I have a list of some ideas. My list is not comprehensive by any means. These are just some ideas to get you thinking. First, the first thing we can all do is become aware. We can learn about bias, learn how it manifests, and we can teach others about it. Next idea, we can establish norms to ensure that women are not interrupted in meetings. Like, for example, set a rule that interruptions in meetings will not be tolerated. And then when it happens, a, the meeting facilitator should call it out. The next idea is to be a workplace ally. So usually we think of allies as people who are supportive outsiders to a group. And we absolutely need the support of men in the workplace. But also women can support each other and we can combat that queen bee narrative. So included here are things that would fall into the category of bystander intervention. And for example, one thing we can do is call out a diminishing treatment of women when we see it. So in particular, here's an example. If you see a woman's idea, a woman being interrupted or her idea being repeated, which is repeated by someone without acknowledgement, you can call that out. You can say, Jane just mentioned that idea. Let's hear her thoughts. The next idea was, is to give, make sure we're giving women credit and celebrating their accomplishments. So I personally fully believe in self-promoting. However, women have tended to be socialized not to do it. So be sure to name and call out women's accomplishments in meetings and other public forums. And then rather than waiting for someone else to call out your accomplishments, you can use a buddy system to help with this. Find colleagues with, him, with whom you can share each other's accomplishments in group settings. Next idea is to share office housework. You wanna make sure that it's not just the women who are taking notes in the meetings and who are organizing the office parties. You wanna dole out those responsibilities in an equitable fashion to, to everybody who's involved in the team or the, uh, or the organization. Next idea is to examine your work cultures, especially work cultures that require everyone to be available long hours and, um, and hours after work, after the normal working hours. So norms can be established around working extra hours. For example, you can encourage everyone to not check email or work after hours, except for you know, those, those cases of uh, an emergency. Um, this would allow women and men both to have good work-life balance, and it would set an equal playing field for women who cannot work extra hours due to their caretaking responsibilities. And the last, the last one here involves establishing paid family leave. Now I'm in the United States and we are the one of the, actually the only, um, I think high income country that does not have a federal national paid family leave policy. Hopefully that's in the works of being changed, but we don't currently have it yet. Um, so I know that fortunately lots of you, some of you anyway, are in countries that do have mandated leave and I, and I think that's a great thing. Um, but I'll say this, but what I want to say about the, the leave, whether you're whether you have a federal national policy for it or a state policy or not, is that it's important that the change that involves family leave, paid family leave, doesn't include just the policy. Organizational leaders must actively encourage both parents to take it. And I say on the slide, I say mandate paternity leave. And the reason is because until men take time off from work to care for newborns women and especially mothers will still be disadvantaged by the perception that they are not as dedicated to their careers as men. 
So these are just a few, few examples, um, and there are plenty more. Um, but one thing you'll notice in these strategies that I listed is I like, don't try to fix the women, all right? And I don't just tell women just to lean in, try harder. I don't say that at all. Because while I believe that lean, learning to play the game and leaning in, it does work for some women, it's a relative minority of women. Our goal here is to create environments where all women can be themselves and flourish, developing their full potential without being held back by systematic barriers. And that being said, you may feel, you know, it's not within your role to have the power to make organizational change. But I encourage you to not assume that change is impossible. You want to do what you can in your own role. And then you want to ask your bosses and your organizational leaders for what you and other women need to establish an equitable workplace. And then you can also address your concerns to legislators who are responsible for enacting laws which can eliminate workplace in inequality. And then not to mention, it's really important, I, I believe in the participation in democratic um, voting uh, system. So it's really important that everyone votes and even consider running for political office yourself um, so that you can be part of the societal changes that are needed. So after hearing all this, you may still wonder, what can I do? If I am personally impacted by gender bias, what can I do? So I wanna leave you, leave you with, with a few strategies. And again, I wanna stress, my strategies do not fall into the category of fix the women. I'm not going to tell you how to dress or how to speak or how to change what's unique about you. Now, these strategies, by the way, were surfaced from a, a dissertation research in which I interviewed um, 26 women leaders in higher education about their most significant per personal and professional adversity. And these were strategies that they, um, that were gleaned from that research. First strategy is to be prepared. And in this context, I mentioned this on the previous slide, you wanna learn about bias, you wanna to learn to recognize it. Second strategy is to depersonalize. If you experience bias, do not take it personally. You are not alone in your experiences. The person exhibiting the bias may not even realize it, that they are being biased, as they are just acting a way in which they were socialized to act. That doesn't make bias or discrimination right or okay, but it does help you to realize that the problem is not you and it's not unique to you. So next, next strategy is to build your support network. You wanna find allies, both men and women and inside and outside of your organization. And here's a tip. This is a tip I like to give when we're dealing with a queen bee, an unsupportive woman who, that you, that you um, are working with. If you can, try to befriend her. Get to know her on a personal level. You know, when things are back to lunch and um, fully safe, you know, ask if you can take her to lunch. Um, express your desire to have a productive working relationship. So while I can't promise the strategy will work with every unsupportive supportive person, but it will work for some. And you wanna maintain and make sure, you know, outside of the people who have been more challenging to work with, make sure you're maintaining your supportive relationships um, so that you have someone to vent to and to strategize with. Uh, the next strategy is self-care, which includes maintaining your perspective. Life is not all about work. Make sure that you have hobbies and friendships outside of work. Prioritize time with your family. Take vacations and really unplug when you're away. Use your out of office reply to let people who email you know that you're away and how they can get help or when they can expect an answer from you. When you are home, be home, uh, instead of being connected to your work email 24 seven. Encourage your coworkers to call or text you if they really do have an emergency. Um, but otherwise you wanna set the expectation that um, you're working during whatever your working hours are and that you are um, only available, you know, outside of that for, for true emergencies. And then last but not least, you wanna have alternatives and be willing to use them. You may find yourself in a situation that's just untenable. Some workplaces and some bosses are just not plain, not supportive. So you consider your options. Could you apply for an, another position either inside or outside of your organization? Could you 
Are you in an area, are you in a job that lends itself to telecommuting or remote work so that you can expand the region of your job search? With the pandemic, lots of organizations uh, are much more open to remote work. Um, there are lots of jobs, lots of organizations, and lots of opportunities to use your skills in a place where you will be valued. So whatever you do, don't let one job or one organization or one person block your personal fulfillment and advancement. So I do believe you can and should try to rectify the problem within your current workplace. But if you keep hitting roadblocks, realize that there are many uh, paths to opportunity and success and you can find them. So with that, I really appreciate having the opportunity to speak to you and I will take your, your questions or comments. Uh, you know, um, I think Islam is gonna, or Shetty is gonna um, facilitate yep. that. Yeah. Slim, please go ahead. I will. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Uh, I'll for stop my share there. Talk. So, all right. So I do have like uh, a few questions. So we can start first with you talked a lot about gender bias, and uh, when it comes to working environments, sometimes we cannot easily differentiate between uh, you know genuine criticism and you know something that is gender bias. So how can we make the difference? Is like, you know, is this feedback, you know, for me to get a better person or like perform well at my work or is it more about who I am and how I look like? So in general, this is not just, you know, for uh, gender, it can also apply to culture bias and other, other areas where, you know, we are different people coming from different cultures. We are very diverse, we are very different. So how can we differentiate between real criticism and uh, biases in general? Well, the first thing I would, you know, the first thing I would say is, this is why it's really critical to become aware of what gender bias is and how it manifests. Like I was giving you, you know, I gave you those four words, you know, heat heating and man interrupting and mansplaining and, you know, appropriating. Because these are common things that happen to women, you know, and you could be sitting in a meeting and you, you say your idea mm -hmm. and nobody responds. Right. And you think, well, to yourself, well, I just had a bad idea or, you know, it wasn't a great idea. And so, you know, you shut down. Well, it doesn't that's not necessarily the case. Right. Um, the case may be that people are just more attuned. They're more biased towards listening to the, you know, the, the voices of the other gender in the room. Right. And that um, that your idea is a solid idea, you know. Um, your, I think the question was specific to criticism, right? So, so having a foundation, like knowing, like what is what does gender bias look like? Like what things, what types of things are women tend do they tend to be criticized for, right? That will help you. That definitely will help you to di differentiate between whether it's something that women are generally criticized for or something that is maybe you know a you know workplace behavior that you know, that anybody, you know, may be um, given, you know, giving uh, criticism for. The other thing to think about is, you know, the person who's giving you the, 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 the criticism or, you know, if, if you can try to, you know, try to think about it in terms of what, where are they coming from? Are they coming from an aspect of being, of really trying to help you, like your, you know, your performance, like really from a good, um, a good place? Or are they just giving you critical? Are they being critical? You know, and are, are they another thing to watch for? Like, are they critical of others? Right. Um, but I can't give you like a, you know, a the um, the quick, um, you know, easy answer to what for what to do in that situation. But it's just generally to be aware of what gender bias is and how it works. Um, you know, I can like because I've studied this for so long. Like, I can go into a lot of situations and just I can see it. You know, or I can I can you know I can identify it. But that's not the case if you haven't, you know, done, um, if you haven't read about it or, you know, tried to under, understand what it is. It's because, like I said, when I was a young IT staffer and I was being criticized because I was, you know, authoritative with a decision, mm -hmm. I thought it was me. I thought there was something wrong with the decision or something wrong with me or I was not leading in the correct way. Um, but that wasn't the case at all. It was the case that they were viewing me differently than they were viewing my my the male boss that preceded me, right? Right. So I think you mentioned something really important here because generally, you know, like uh, you mentioned preparation, we need to learn about these biases and how they manifest. Because if you don't know that, how can you, you know, basically spot out these, you know, uh, differences in behaviors and responses? 
So, uh, yeah, so we do have a question. I'm going to take a question here uh, from the audience. Uh, Helena is asking, it can be difficult to call this behavior out as a young female researcher with only male supervisors and mainly male colleagues. Not all young researchers have the confidence to do this. How can one get around this in the research workplace? Uh, so, um, or should more senior members step up to notice it more? So yeah, so this is more like, you know, a, a detailed um, yeah. uh, question about the same topic, yeah. Well, I'm gonna, I'll answer it from two ways because yes, like to the end, the end of your question, the last question there. Yes, more senior researchers, the senior people in the organization need to step up and they need to learn about bias and they need to learn, like, be actively preventing it, right? And actively calling it out and actively supporting, you know, the junior people. So, yes, like, that's, like, that's the answer. But in the real world, we know that that doesn't always happen. Or even if it does happen, you, if you're in that junior position, you may not feel like you have the status or the, the place to call out that, you know, to call out the bias behavior on your own behalf. Um, it can put you in an awkward position. And, you know, for what I, what I say to that is, you know, a couple of things. One, if you have a good relationship with your, with your uh, boss, you know, um, and you feel comfortable with that person, certainly talk to, you know, talk to him or her, um, get their advice, get their support. If you don't feel like that's a comfortable place to go, if you have an HR in your organization, you know, you may be able to get some confidential help, you know, from an HR uh, type resource. But barring, you know, barring those two things, the other thing I recommend is that whole idea of the support network. You, you know, you're gonna look around your organization at all levels and try to make um, relationships with people at all different levels in your organization so that you've got confidants, close contacts, somebody else that you can go to even outside of your own team or outside of your own uh, organizational structure that you can go to those people or, you know, that person, you know, you're uh, hopefully it's more than one, right? But you can go to them and say, hey, I'm having this problem. Like I am being diminished or I am being put down or I am being, you know, my voice isn't being heard. What do you suggest? You know, so that you have someone who can, maybe that person can advocate on your behalf. Maybe they're not in a role to advocate on your behalf directly, but maybe they can give you ideas and other options. And then I always say, you know, if, if you're like, don't, like I said at the end of the talk, don't let one you know, if you try to make change in your workplace and you try to make change and you try to make change and you ask for help and you, you know, you, you go through all the steps, don't keep hitting, beating your head against the wall, you know, really consider your alternatives and at what time is it time to, you know, to cut, cut the string, uh, to, you know, look for, look for other opportunities. I say that is that it is truly a last resort and, you know, you don't, you want to make, you know, spend the time to try to, you know, improve the situation where you are, but don't feel that you have to be stuck where you are if you try to make change and it just isn't working out. Thank you so much. So basically take home message, talk about it. Just yes. if you feel something is wrong, just talk about it to yes. someone. Confide in someone in your environment, uh, a good colleague, male, female, doesn't matter, just mm -hmm. get some feedback. All right, yes. so we have another question from April. Uh, she said, thank you, Dr. DL, for putting this together and presenting this to us. It's so important to understand these challenges. I have a question about peer review uh, are women more negatively targeted, uh, which means like more critical reviews or more rejects in general? What if you feel that you were subjected to this? How should you call it out? And what if you call it out and the response is non-sympathetic from the editor? Yeah, that's another, that's another tough one. This happens, um, by the way. <laughs> it does happen. And you want to maintain, you know, good relationships with, you know, with the editors, especially, you know, and, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, like scholarly publishing becomes a very small world where people, you know, people, you know, they, we all know each other, you know, at a certain point, right? Um, to your point, Islam, yes, you want to talk about it. Like you want to, first of all, I would use that thing of go to, go to your, you know, your confidant, your, your, somebody within your, you know, your own research um, your network that you can trust and talk, talk, talk the situation through with them and get some, you know, get some external you know, um, thoughts on it. If, if you conclude that, yes, this really does feel like I, you know, I'm being, uh, you know, targeted or I'm being given a negative feedback and it's not, it's not valid, it's not based on the work, it's based on something else, perhaps, perhaps gender bias, then, then I, you know, I think you can, you can, again, you have to be careful and you have to think about, do you want to write, respond to that editor or not? But, you know, you can't, like, there are ways to, you know, very professionally, very kindly, 
um, you know, to send an email to an, an editor and just, you know, you know, you don't want to be like super hypercritical of the editor and you don't want to try to put them in a bad spot, but you know, there are ways to, um, to reach out to that person and just, you know, just ask, you know, you can even just, even just ask them, this is what I am sensing. This is what I'm thinking. What do you think, Mr. or Ms. or doctor, editor? Um, um, so yeah, I definitely think that, you know, if we don't speak up, nothing changes, okay? So, and I, and I can't give you, again, I can't give you a carte blanche, like always go to that, you know, always, you know, call it out or not, but I would say don't, you know, don't let it, you know, just sweep it under the rug or whatever. Talk about it, talk about it to your peers, get some good feedback, and then, and then do consider sending a gentle email to the editor to ask them, you know, inquisitive, I'm curious, you know, ask, ask them about, you know, looking at this again. Um, and, you know, sometimes, again, sometimes, you know, there are lots of journals, um, so sometimes it's better to cut, you know, and like not give, you know, you get a bad, a, you know, biased, you know, sort of response from one journal, you know, maybe if you go to the next one and submit and just cut your losses, you know, with, with, you know, the first one, but, but yeah, it, yeah, the first step is really like finding a peer in your, in your own research network that you can, can bounce the situation off of and get some, uh, get some advice that way and perspective. Thank you so much. Um, I actually, I can really relate to this uh, question. So I think the most important thing, uh, all of those, what, what you shared with us is like a very uh, interesting piece of advice, but definitely uh, send an email back, evidence-based, I would say. Don't, yes. don't feel emotional about it. Yes. Don't yes. pour your feelings out yes. there. Just be very critical, like in a nice, gentle way. Evidence-based, we are scientists, just, you know, Talk the science language and you'll be fine. But don't don't let it just, you know, don't sweep it up, how do you say under the rug, right? Yeah. And yeah. the other tip there would be take that email that you write to the editor, send it to your <laughs> send it to a, somebody else for feedback before you send it to the editor so that you know someone else can read it and give you and say, is this like to your point as long does it have the emotion taken out of it? Is it evidence-based? You know, like send it to someone else first before you shoot it off to that editor so that you can get some good, some good feedback on it. Okay, great. So oh, we do have a few minutes left, unfortunately, in this event. However, um, I, I would like, you know, to ask maybe two quick questions before mm -hmm. we wrap up. The first one, uh, I'm very curious about, you shared many things in your presentation about gender uh, biases, but what about the most shocking facts in your research? You know, maybe, you know, like you can, um, you know, um, I mean, when it comes to bias, maybe you can think about something that is re very redundant, that is like, you know, uh, uh, for example, you talked about the queen bee, you, can, you, you have lots of other types of biases, biases but maybe something uh, shocking that we really need to prioritize and, and um, you know, like look at, consider in our working environments, uh, in our conferences, et cetera. So what is our top priority according to your research? Well, you know, I think, especially because in this, in this new world where we are all, you know, we're not sitting in a room together. And I, I do miss that, you know, because I miss being able to see everyone, get the feed, you know, get the face-to-face -face feedback, make those connections. But we know that moving forward, like we're not, we're not moving, like we're not, not everything is going to move back to face-to-face. -to -face. This virtual thing will be, will be with us, right? Um, it's just given us too many, um, too many good conveniences. So, uh, you know, I think about Okay, we got to think about how were the biases manifesting in the face-to-face -face world. In some cases, they are the same; they just transferred over to the virtual world. But in some other cases, they're a little bit different. And you know, I think about my example of the virtual harassment, um, where you know we really want to be careful that in your organizations that people are not being harassed in the privacy of their own, you know, home offices or wherever it is that they're working from, right? Because, like I said, of not having the, the coworkers there that can overhear or that they can, you know, just run next door to, um, um, it can make, really put people in a precarious situation. When, for example, if you're on the cell phone with with somebody who is harassing you, and if that person happens to be your uh, somebody who's a superior, you may not feel that you can even just like hang up on them, right? So I really think that we need to be looking at, and I I use the harassment as one example. You know, the other. Like what are the things within the virtual environment have changed, you know, and there's other examples um, um, too, like, like I talked about exclusion, you know, um, women, because I'm not, because we are not, none of us are at these events in person, I can't go and make these kind of informal, you know, 
uh, contact. So how can we um, set up um, maybe more formalized, you know, um, processes or opportunities for women to connect uh, with others, you know, um, you know, within the midst of a um, even, you know, within us being at our uh, virtual or, you know, remote location. Um, Thank you so much, uh, Amy, for joining us today. Actually, we're running out of time and like the, the oral, the next oral session has just started. Okay. So, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's been wonderful having you and thank you for answering all these questions. So uh, hopefully I'll get to see you at some point, you know, and meet all of us uh, on site. So I wish everyone, the attendees, a great Mikai and please join the networking events uh, and see you soon. Thanks. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Shadi. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you for having me.